I'm Trina and today I'm going to review the book Dragonfly and Amber by Dana Gabaldon which is the second book in the Outlander series and I want to in particular discuss the reasons why I did not like this book and the things that I found to be very problematic about it. I did review this book briefly in my June wrap up where I reviewed all the books that I read in June but I did have a few people that asked me to please elaborate on exactly what I was talking about when I said some things in this book were just like perpetuating rape culture. This video is chock full of spoilers for both books one and two in the Outlander series, BT dubs. I feel like I don't need to have disclaimers in negative videos, but with this one I'm just wanting to make sure that everyone knows I'm trying to tread lightly. This is a review of the content in the book only. This is not a review of the readers that love this book because I completely understand you may not see the same things that I am seeing. Maybe somebody processed these things, saw them as bad, and moved on a lot quicker than I did. I am not here to tell you how you should feel about this book. I'm only here to tell you how I felt about it. Every time I talk about Dragonfly and Amber lately, I get comments of people saying people need to understand that this is in a totally different time period. You need to understand that this was written in the 90s. It's written and set in a totally different time period and you don't need to be so harsh on them. That's the vibe I kind of get from these comments that I just don't understand how things were back then. Well, first of all, no, I don't understand how things were back then because I don't live in the 1700s and I don't have a time machine to go back there and see how accurate these books are or not. But I want to make it clear that I am fully aware of the time period that these books are set. It says it on the pages, 1700s. I'm aware that this is not modern times. I'm also fully aware that this series has been around for over 20 years. It was written in the 90s. That's a time period that I grew up in. And I know that things were different then than they are today. I've witnessed the changes in history that we've had in just the past 20 years through my own lifetime. I fully understand this was not set in or written in our current time and the things that we talk about today concerning rape culture and what we believe are good and bad portrayals of things may not have been the same thing that books were trying to portray in the 90s or that people were doing in the 1700s. I fully understand that. I've made an entire discussion video about cultural relativism. I'll link you to that video instead of just repeating everything because I've already had a whole long discussion on it. These books are something that have made me think about that for sure. I can respect the fact that an author or any book, especially historical books, want to portray something very accurately even if it includes very dark themes but also there are so many classic works that have stood the test of time that don't present things in a problematic way and so what my main concern with a dragonfly and amber is that a lot of these themes being presented for accuracy are just flat out problematic and they contradict the book itself so i'm going to get into these examples now in dragonfly and amber on page 132 claire and jamie are about to go to french court to meet a bunch of people and claire is wearing a very low cut dress that kind of shows her cleavage jamie this is a direct quote guys he says lord woman have you no notion of what you look like in that gown it makes me want to commit rape on the spot so the problem with this to me this perpetuates rape culture because he has used the word rape synonymously with sex and these two acts are not the same thing because sex implies that consent was given any other choice of words where he didn't have to say rape as in he was going to take her against her will you know like he could have said anything else in that scene and then he tells her she should cover up because if she doesn't cover up she is basically inviting the other men of French court to rape her sure enough later on in the scene she does get kind of accosted and groped in a dark alleyway and later on he says it is her fault for having worn the dress and wandered off into dark hallways. That is complete victim blaming. It just is like, oh, he couldn't help himself because you did these things. You are asking for it. That's, that's not okay. Another scene that perpetuates rape culture from book one, there's a scene where Jamie and his group are attacked by enemy soldiers in the middle of the night. They kill them all, they escape, and then as they're laying down to go to sleep, Jamie kind of rolls on top of Claire and he's like, I have to have you right now. After killing, after battle, men's blood just gets to boiling so badly that we have to have this giant release in the form of sex. And Claire literally is saying no. Claire says, not here. No, I'm not tired. I just don't want to do it. Jamie, there are 20 men sleeping right next to us. She says no at least three times, but he still rolls on top of her. And as soon as he starts doing it with her, she, her walls like come down and she gets really into it, right? There's another scene in this book where Jamie and Claire are attacked by soldiers while they're in the middle of doing it in some field. And when they escape, they continue doing it with each other because again, their blood has been all worked up and they need this release. Lastly, at the end of this book, Jamie himself is actually raped by the main villain of 
the story. And in all three of these cases, where she has said no to Jamie, and he continues to do it with her anyway, and then she ends up enjoying it. Then she's almost raped, escapes, does it with Jamie, and enjoys it. And then when Jamie is raped himself, he ends up admitting that part of him liked it. The reason that these three examples are perpetuating rape culture is because the book continues to cast rape as something that should be a turn-on. It always turns these scenes into something that ends up being pleasurable. While I myself have not been through situations exactly like this, and I do understand that there can be a lot of guilt and, you know, tricky emotions that arise when you do go through a sexual assault, especially if you know the person, like this is her husband, you know, granted, it's her husband, so of course it's reasonable that she would eventually be turned on by her own husband, but the fact is is that it's turning rape into something that, oh, the woman actually liked. That's what the problem is. It's saying that men can keep pushing and pushing and just going for it, even when the woman says no, because no doesn't really mean no, because she's really going to enjoy it in the end, you know? Or he, in Jamie's case, he's really going to enjoy it in the end. He really wanted that, so it was okay for you to have raped this other person. That is the problem. The first of those examples also perpetuates the idea that men cannot be held accountable for committing rape because their bodies just cannot be controlled. They are not in control of their urges and they just have to go do it with whoever just happens to be walking by in a dark alley. No. Saying that men are not accountable for their urges, what women are wearing is responsible for the rape that takes place. That when women say no, they really mean yes because they're going to ultimately end up enjoying it. Or men in that case. And using the term rape synonymously with sex, these are just four huge examples that are perpetuating rape culture. And I totally understand that in the 1700s, these conversations were not happening about what rape culture even is, or why it's a bad thing, and I also understand that in the 90s when these books were written, the same can be said. We were not having the same conversations about rape culture that we do have today. The problem with this, and why it goes beyond just historical accuracy, and why, well, that's just how the time period was, so we all need to get over it and just kind of move on, the problem with it is because established in this series, in both of the books in the series, it is established time and time over that rape is a bad thing. In the first book, Jamie believes his sister Jenny was raped by Randall. Jamie himself ends up being raped by Randall in the end, and that is definitely seen as a bad thing. In this book, there is the rape of Mary Hawkins. When it is found out who Mary Hawkins' assailant is, that person is killed in revenge for having raped Mary Hawkins. When it was found out that Randall attempted to rape Fergus, Jamie went after him with the intention of killing him because this raping was considered a bad thing. You have some characters that are committing rape and they are seen as the villains and they deserve to die as punishment for it. On the other hand, you have the main character Jamie and some of his crew rape and make a lot of rapey references and they are hailed as the heroes. Like where is the difference here? Is it just because Oh, well, we're supposed to feel sorry for Jamie because he has also been a victim himself or because he had it builds character It has a tragic backstory you know, newsflash, it's the 1700s in wartime, everybody has a tragic backstory. Is it because Jamie's hot and Randall is supposed to be not hot, although he looks exactly like Claire's first husband who she must have found hot enough to have married in the first place, so like, what is the difference here? Why are we casting some rapists as villains and some rapists as heroes? The last thing that I'm going to touch on in this review about why I really did not like, especially Dragonfly and Amber, is that I feel as if Jamie and Claire's relationship is an abusive and unhealthy relationship. Early on in the book, on page 138, Claire has returned from that party where she wore the revealing gown. There's a scene after they return from that party between Claire and Jamie where he's mad at her and basically saying, you need to be punished for your behavior. You said you didn't mean to beat me, I remind him, sitting a bit further back in my chair just to be on the safe side. Do I look like the sort of man who would beat a woman who's with child, he demanded? I eyed him doubtfully. This is just a whole mess of stuff. The problem with the scene is that she is actually scooting back on her chair just to be on the safe side and she eyes him doubtfully when he says he wouldn't beat her. This is a woman clearly showing fear that her husband is going to beat her. His words himself are very problematic because he says, do I look like I'd beat a woman with child? Is that implying that you would beat a woman who wasn't with child? Like, I just... It's the fact that she is afraid of him is the problem. She knows better, she's from the 1900s, and she's living in fear of her husband that he's gonna beat her, you know? like. I, I can't get behind that kind of a relationship. That's not healthy. Then there is this wonderful scene on page 677, which just like is the epitome of a toxic relationship. 
They're having a conversation about the lineage of Claire's first husband in the 1900s, Frank, saying if Randall, his ancestor, died, Frank would not still be alive, and she really wants Frank to be alive because she did love him at some point. So she brings up Frank, and, and Jamie just goes off on her, and he is like, forget him, forget you too while I'm at it. I certainly do begrudge you. I begrudge every memory of yours that doesn't hold me, and every tear you've ever shed for another, and every second you've spent in another man's bed. He knocks the glass out of her hand, kisses her, draws back, and shakes her. You are mine, Claire, mine, and I will not share you, not with a man or a memory or anything whatever, so long as we both shall live. You'll never mention that man's name again to me, do you hear? He kissed me fiercely to emphasize the point. Do you hear me, he asks. Yes, I say with some difficulty. If you'd stop shaking me, I'd answer you. He's physically shaking her to the point where she can't even speak well. So he is exhibiting demands and extreme jealousy and possessiveness right here. He is physically shaking her, shaming her for the past that she's had with any other man. Then she stops this whole confrontation from happening by asking if he will make love to her. And that's how they kind of tie everything up. And this is something that happens time and time again. Claire is mad at Jamie and his actions so often in this series and it always ends up resolving through the use of sex. You can have the most amazing sexual relationship with somebody but if they are not respecting your wishes, if they are making demands of you, it's not a healthy relationship. It's not the best relationship to be in. If anyone is saying you're overreacting to that, that's not a harmful relationship because he's not hitting her and beating her and like he's not an alcoholic and whatever. Okay, but that's a stereotype. There are so many different ways that unhealthy relationships can manifest and I'm saying all of that looking at that relationship as a woman that has been through a relationship like that. I was in a very unhealthy relationship where I was put down with insults in order for that partner to be the one to bring me back up with compliments because that builds an emotional dependency because they make you feel like nobody else in the entire world would ever love you because you're a terrible person for all these things that they bring up. And then when you're at that really low emotional point, they're the one to bring you back up so that you think this is the only person that will ever love me despite all these other flaws. That is emotional manipulation it is toxic, it is not healthy, and a partner does not have to be hitting you across the face for it to be a physically abusive relationship. You don't shake people that you love, that you care about. You don't grab someone, shake them so hard that they can't speak and that they're in pain from it. You just... This is not healthy in my opinion. I don't even want to continue reading this series because it's just not portraying something that I can get behind. And I do understand that people who have not lived through that are not going to see it in the same way. It's not going to trigger them in the same way that it does me. They may not recognize all the same signs that I would have because I've lived through it. I do think it's completely okay if you read this book and you read that scene and didn't think anything of it. But that's why I'm here to, you know, tell you about it. Because if we don't know the things that are bad from the people who've been through them, how do we recognize it? How do we talk about it? How do we understand what other people are going through? By no means do I think that everyone who has read these books should have read that scene and seen the exact same things that I did. And I totally, totally understand why people would like this because the books do try really hard to get you to romanticize Jamie. Because these scenes almost always end in sex, the books are definitely portraying him as a romanticized, sexualized character, and that's what I kind of take issue with. It just allows that rape culture, that victim blaming, and that saying that men can't be held accountable for their actions because they can't control themselves, it kind of just perpetuates that and it allows that to be okay. I definitely want you to know I am not shaming you if you liked these books, and I don't mean to make you feel like agitated or defensive about it because you're allowed to like it, but these are my thoughts on my channel. That's what I wanted to say about the book in case anyone was wondering exactly what I meant when I was saying I found it pretty problematic. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great day and I will see you in the comments. Bye!